The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You know, men devise plans every single day. Sometimes they follow through with those plans. Often, the plans are fluid, which means they change every hour by circumstance. And so while most people can know an initial plan, it does not mean that they're going to complete that plan. As they stated it, things change for mankind from day to day. We have one constant, a constant being something that does not change, and as our Lord and Savior. He was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We can, in fact, place our confidence in Him without any worries whatsoever. We can also place our confidence in His Word, certainly in the words He spoke. Most importantly, our Father did more than tell us a story and give us a history. He gave us a way. He gave us a code of conduct as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. He gave us a code of conduct. And it's about time we adopt all of what he said to put that into practice. Just imagine yourself now. You're in the kingdom. There's no more negativity. No more entertainment as you know it. No more. No more excuses. No more anything. The question is, are you prepared for that now? Are you prepared for that now? Really? In your heart, are you prepared for that? You know, there's, there's something I often think about. A lot of people say, well, I have so many negative things to contend with. There's just the environment that's negative in this and the other. And I keep feeding into it. I'm going to give you a thought, something I think about often. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, when they were in the Garden of Eden, God told them not to eat of the tree of good and evil. He said, don't eat of that tree. You can eat of any other tree. Don't eat of that tree. Of course, Satan beguiled or enchanted Eve to take that fruit and then she in turn enchanted Adam. Something happened though, something that's usually missed. God said, okay, now that they've eaten of this tree and they know both good and evil, we cannot let them eat of the tree of life because they've become like us knowing good and evil. Listen to me. God said they have become like us knowing good and evil. Lest they partake of the, or eat of the tree of life and live forever. That sticks out to me. They have become like us, knowing good and evil. Listen, here's what I got out of that. God made us in his own image after his likeness. We, too, know good and evil. And if the heavenlies know good and evil, but they chose the good, what is our excuse? What in the world is our problem? I give this to you. Satan has also enchanted a great many people into telling them little sayings like, you can never be perfect. You're always going to make mistakes. That is hogwash. Jesus would not tell us anything that we could not accomplish. If the heavenlies, if they know good and evil, and we know good and evil, it's a simple point of making a choice. Satan has beguiled many people into thinking they're always going to make mistakes, make the wrong choice. Even the word mistake and sin has been intertwined in their two different things. A mistake is when you mess up in division. When you're multiplying numbers and the answer is not right, that's a mistake. A mistake is not going into a bank and robbing it. A mistake is nothing you premeditate. A mistake is not when you react out of anger. That is not a mistake. Satan has also enchanted the world with these sayings. It was written in the word, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is also perfect. Now why would Jesus tell us that if we could not accomplish it? I say this, we can. We don't want to. We are too busy justifying our own lives, justifying our lifestyle, making the wrong things in our lives right. Listen, you were born in sin, meaning that your flesh is sinful, but you can overcome the flesh. If you could not overcome the flesh, then a portion of what Jesus said is not true. Now, which one is, which one is more likely that we can overcome the flesh? We are inherently stubborn. We are inherently prideful, and we tend to take up for our flesh. You know why? Because no one wants to be humbled by anybody else. No one wants to be humbled by anybody else. This is why we defend our positions like fools. This is why we place ourselves above our neighbors like fools, because 
a person with true power like Jesus did, he, he didn't go around demonstrating in front of the Romans and everything what type of power he had. You know why? Because he had it. He made a choice too. He followed through. What is our excuse? What are we doing? What are we doing? And I'm not saying this, that people become uh, prideful minded, saying I make no mistakes. No, we are to aspire to be just like our Lord and Savior, but we cannot take up for our flesh. We cannot. We have to take captive our thoughts, come against those things that exalt itself above God in our minds. It's a simple choice. Just as Satan beguiled Eve, so did he beguile the world with his saying. No one's perfect. That's a saying. When people say that, that's like telling your flesh, you can do what you want to do. We're trying, but go ahead and keep sinning. Now, wouldn't that sound foolish? We're, we're trying to do the best for you. Listen, here's trying. Have you ever tried to breathe? No, because you can breathe. But if you were drowning in water, then you would try not to breathe. We either do or we do not. We make a choice. A choice has two outcomes, not three. We either do or don't do it all. It's a choice. There's no in between. But we have gotten into the habit of making excuses for our flesh. This is where pride comes from. Pride is born out of someone defending their flesh because they want to be worth something. They want to be worth something in view of men. And so people like that with pride, they'll defend every position that they have. In other words, if I was a person of pride, you would always be wrong, I would always be right. That's what pride does. But because God loves us, he will abase the proud, bring them all the way down to the bottom. Well, who wants to go through that process over and over and over again? Number one, it slows your learning process down. When you're bought down like that, that means you didn't get it the last time. And if you don't comprehend it, don't make adjustments, you're going to be bought low again. And if you continue to do it, the Lord says he's going to give you over to a reprobate mind. See, when we continue doing things, he will give us over to a reprobate mind. We'll believe that what we're doing is not live like that. We shouldn't. You know, one of tomorrow's discussions, if I can come there, is what makes presidents cry. What makes powerful men of all nations hold their head in their hands in utter shock? What makes their jaws drop? They find out things and it shatters their world. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Then their actions will begin to make sense. But we have to be careful not to, listen, if, if we walk right with our Lord. I'll tell you another scary scripture, and it really bothers me. It's the one where these people, having gone, having died, and went face to face with Jesus at the time of accountability, did everything right. And Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You know, that is a troubling scripture. Don't you think that's a troubling scripture? They cast out devils in the name of Jesus. They did miracles in the name of Jesus. They taught in the name of Jesus. And he still said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. What did they do? Because by the letter, they did everything right. By the letter. And they performed it. And Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Isn't that a bit troubling? That a bit troubling. I suggest that they fail to adopt something. See, to to do something in the name of Jesus is totally different than his love being in your heart. Only a child shares the heart of its parent. Only a child will share the traits of its parent. If you keep reading in the scriptures of what Jesus was talking about prior to that time, you'd understand that these people had no love. They desired to have a name, a position. These were the same ones, and he compared them to somebody else, the spies. He compared them to the spies. You know what the Lord said, do you good deeds in secret, that your Father may reward you openly. Do you know how many people, when they do a good deed, they have to go and get a megaphone and announce it? Because they want the attention. They want the attention. The Lord said, do your good deeds in secret, that the Father may reward you openly. See, that takes a bit of humility and meekness to do that. But if you have pride, you want everybody to know what you did. That's against the commandments of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everything he told us to do, by the way, is a commandment. And he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, the commandments of Jesus, those things he told us to do. 
He said, if you don't keep my commandments, then you don't love me. And the Father's love is not toward you either. You're of a different spirit. He said, why even call me Lord if you don't listen to what I say? By the way, these are foundational things that are tearing people to shreds. It's never the big things that beguile an individual. It's only those tiny things, the parts of the foundation that people automatically think they have perfected. Jesus spoke about us having a good foundation, the one that he established, not the one that we establish, not the thoughts and the recognition we seek so much but a foundation full of him. And he was humble. He was meek. He didn't lift up a finger toward anybody. He truly did war against principalities and powers. That's why he casted out demons and healed the sick. He didn't fight against people. His fight was not against people. God is long-suffering. Our Savior is long-suffering. What is wrong with us? What's wrong with us? If, If he is our Father and his seed is within us, What is wrong with us? Who has enchanted us? Who's beguiled us? Whose voice are we listening to? Because Jesus taught very important things. Men teach things of the world, and the world does not know Jesus Christ. If they knew Jesus Christ right now, the world did. And those things that are responsible to this world, if they knew Jesus Christ, everything would be different. But it's not. Satan has been beguiling people so long, and we bought into it in a large degree. You know what? It's, it's, it's strange because there are some things in this world that are important, but there are other things that are not important. There are a great many things that are distraction, and there are a great many things that are severely important. We tend to pay attention to the dramatics of life not to the foundations we should have of life. There is a foundation of life we should have, but our souls have to prosper. Then our lifestyles conform to our souls. That's why it was written, I would that you prosper as your soul prospers. They're intimately tied. If your soul does not prosper, the Lord will continue to strip things off, normally because we don't want to make a true decision. And you know what? I found out something else. To make the right decision is always in the face of adversity. Sometimes it can cause embarrassment. Sometimes that choice presents itself at the wrong time in your life. But if you're humble, you don't care. See, if you're humble, you'll make a choice whether it embarrasses you or not. You'll make the right choice. But if you're prideful, you can't make that choice for risk of losing your height in the public time, if you're prideful. If you're humble and me, you can make that choice quickly. Pride destroys us. Pride has beguiled us. How many times do we really defend our positions in a conversation? An humble person will walk away. A meek person will automatically see the value, the, the no value being in that discussion, but will often show love to diffuse it quickly. A prideful person will with the last breath that they have till they can't talk anymore attempt to prove their point. By the way, at a height of pride when you're in a conversation, when pride steps in, your heart rate starts to go up. You begin to get tense and everything else because you're in full defense with what you just said. The world calls that debating. I call it unhealthy. We're not that type of people. That's why we truly cannot accept any job either. I certainly won't accept certain positions No matter what my qualifications are, I will not do it. I will not compromise what I believe for the sake of any amount of money, any securities or anything else. I just simply won't do it. Some people during my career have said that I was extremely foolish for not doing this or that. But when you're already humble, you don't care what the world says. You care about what the Father approves of. And if you love the Father, you don't want to disappoint Him. You understand that He's your Father. He has standards you want to achieve. And you do desire to walk with him. And the more choices we make in line with this word, we find ourselves in a closer walk with him. Once you do that, you don't want to give it up. You desire to walk with no one else. In fact, he becomes first, everything else is secondary. Everything. Not just one or two things. Everything else is secondary. Because you can't walk with anybody else like you do with the Lord. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but in my prayers, it turns into a conversation of admittance 
of a great many things. You know, you feel so good when you can talk to your Father in Heaven and open yourself to Him. You've heard every thought. Every secret thought we had, He has seen them visually. But when you open yourself up and you're totally open to Him in conversation, confessing everything that you can confess, He brings things to your remembrance. Once you ask for true repentance and forgiveness, it's gone. When you repent, by the way, to repent is not just simply to say, Lord, forgive me. It's not it. You see, when you truly repent, you do not like the thing you did. You don't like the way that you had. And when you ask him for forgiveness, you're ready to turn away from that sin completely. It's almost like you burning your hand. When you burn your hand, you're not going to do it again. You know why? Because you understood the pain of that burn, you're not apt to do it again. And for some of us, some of us have repented in word, but when you get sick of a situation and you begin to see what it has actually done to you, that's when you turn away from and never do it again. Repent in its original term almost translates into to turn away from and never do it again. Some of us have, we, we really have, We've gotten used to saying, Lord, forgive me. And then three days later, go out and do the same thing. And so, oh, Lord, forgive me. That has become traditional with a lot of people. But when you truly seek repentance, you are, you see what that sin has done. It has cost you something. When you really turn away from something, it has cost you something. And then you do turn away. That's why a lot of people who have smoked before, and they don't want to smoke anymore. They don't go around people with cigarettes. They don't want to smell it. They do. You know, that happens when they first stop smoking. They just don't want to be around it. Alcohol is the same thing. Some people can't uh, go around the same people they used to be around anymore because they hated where it led them to. They don't like where it led them to. When you want to stop something, all you have to do is look and see what it's taken from you. How it has, has it enhanced your life or not? That's all you have to do is reflect on that. You, you know what, Tanya? I am not, look, I'm a, I'm a guy, just like uh, I'm a human being, just like you are. But the Lord said, do not drink to the point of drunkenness. You know what? If you drink until you're drunk, you know what happens to you? You turn into someone else. You go beyond your natural characteristics. Your mind is susceptible to influence. It's pushing to the wind. You're not sober-minded. Your choices are wrong and everything else. It alters your mental state of mind and then eventually you end up doing something and you know, people do things they wish they hadn't done plus in this day and age I'll tell you this in this day and age it pays to be sober about all things it really does it pays to be sober you know I, I normally do anything that I do it has to have a purpose or a reason have a purpose or a reason this is why I probably can't sit down at everybody's dinner table because the food I consume has to have a purpose I don't eat for enjoyment I eat for, uh, you know, what do I need to feed my body this day? I really do not eat for enjoyment. It's simply to serve a purpose. It serves a purpose to keep my body going. And over the years, I've trained my body to do that. And so I don't, uh, you know, I don't go out here craving snacks and so forth. I like toast because I like the iron. Lots of iron content in toast. I, I just love the iron. So I tend to do things to, just to feed my body. I don't, I can't eat for enjoyment. The truth is, if I didn't have to eat, I wouldn't eat at all. But I get really hungry. But I like protein, and, and I take supplements, and I have studied the Bible and what the body needs to function and operate and symptoms of being nutritionally deficient, including attitudes. And you know what? Most of these children today, their parents had a nutritional deficiency carried over to their children, and still the parents will not give that child multivitamins. I've seen a kid with autism. He had autism when he was uh, born, obviously. And seizures, autism and seizures. Um, I knew his father, and I had told him, you know, seizures are normally caused through electric impulses that can't be controlled and this, that, and the other. Well, the kid had a blood test, and I said, well, he's probably low in manganese and, and magnesium and potassium and so and so and so on. All his conducted material in his body that goes through his brain was concentrated in certain areas. Neurologists can really break that down. I'm not a neurologist. At any rate, they put him on uh, three different types of medications. Well, over the years, 
um, they weren't doing anything. The kid was still having seizures and everything else. And I just told the guy, get the kid a multivite and let the body do what it's supposed to do. For the first two years of taking a multivite, the seizures stopped. They stopped. And, of course, fat does absorb all the unregulated neuron firing in the brain. But the seizures stopped. Then his aptitude for learning kicked in almost all at one time. Sometimes these doctors, when they read your blood levels, they won't really read your nutritional levels at all. That's a separate blood test. A multivite is $6 for about 90 of them. That's a three-month supply. Very important. You know, your car won't get very far without oil, will it? It surely won't go anywhere without gas. And if you put diesel fuel in your gasoline car, you're going to have problems. A lot of us are doing that. You don't have enough uh, of the uh, B vitamins in your system for your brain to function normally. It's a host of things. But the basics of what I'm talking about, you can eat as healthy as ever. But if you don't take a multivitamin, I guarantee you have nutritional levels that are below normal. Because all the nutrients and minerals are not in the foods that you eat. They're gone from the soils. The soils have not been replenished. They normally replenish the soils with K1. They feed the animals with you don't know what they feed them with. But if you take a multivite, it goes back in your system. And you need that to, to properly function. Some of you would notice, if you took a multivite for seven days, you'd notice the difference between the time you took it and the time you didn't. And all you have to do to notice the difference is after seven days, don't take any. And once you feel the next day, you're going to feel sluggish, lethargic, and everything else. Some people have... Uh, their, their pains in their system are more than normal. They don't know the oxygen levels in the atmosphere are being compromised. If you can't get oxygen into your system and balance that with nitrogen, your pain levels are going to go up. Also, if you don't have enough potassium and other minerals, inflammation will start. So you end up taking medication for an anti-inflammatory and arthritis and this, that, and you know, the ingredients or the substance it needs to correct itself. It attempts to prepare itself every three days anyway. If it does not have what it needs, it can't prepare itself. Anyway, that's the uh, my, my version of a small health lesson for now. Sometimes I say things to circumvent situations that I know are coming. I know they're coming. One of the difficulties in, in these weather patterns that the Earth is going through is that, the, 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 uh, of course, the models are ran by several supercomputers. I mean, fast computers. Even they are having difficulty tracking because the Earth is, is actually uh, rotating differently than it usually was. Of course, it's hard for you to notice because of gravity and the, the changes are very minute right now. Um, but as it begins to teeter and totter more and more, it's going to be inescapable for an individual not to notice something is off. People will begin to lose their balance quite frequently, not knowing why. Trees will grow in these strange patterns. Things will change. Of course, the crust will continue to uh, stabilize. And it happens in frequency. Earth, a week of earthquakes and, and, and volcanic activity, then a week of little earthquakes, and then another week of earth. When that frequency increases, until it gets to the point where every day there's a potential hazard with earthquakes, then you know that wobble has, has, has really began to take an effect. That's not to mention the sun and its solar flares adding heavy materials into the atmosphere. I think I'm more concerned about geological events and the state of the body of Christ than anything else, because I know it's time for people to, to actually stand for one another. It's a difference in standing and then standing for one another. I think that uh, the body of Christ has to be sen um, sensitive to other people in the body of Christ. Geological events are, are telling us what could happen. Of course, those things are being restrained at the moment, but one day, when things get really bad, of course, you're going to have to endure just a little bit of that until you're swept out of the way. But there's something very close. Here's another scripture that bothers me. It doesn't bother me. It, it's more, it's hopeful. Here's a scripture, you ready? And they knew not, it's a script, scripture fragment. They knew not until the floodwaters came and took them all away. That really gives me, uh, I don't know, it's not my interpretation of the scripture. 
scripture. It's just that it's very hopeful. It's hopeful because, and that, that is uh, actually, that's Matthew twenty four thirty nine. The reason why it's hopeful is this. If the world doesn't know when their calamity is coming, if they don't know when the calamity is coming, that means events were so subtle, they were not very noticeable. There were not these big, sudden things that happened that gave everybody a clue when things were going to happen. It's not the way it worked. It's not the way it worked. He says, it says, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Isn't that something? The people at the time of Noah didn't know of any true danger until the floodwaters came and took them all away. They missed it. How could they miss it? So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. We know the events that happen when people see the sign of the... Uh, Son of Man in heaven, they go hide themselves. We read that in Isaiah. They'll drop everything they're doing to go hide in the crevices of a rock. They knew the Lord was after them, didn't they? They were scared to death. We know that when the Lord arises, He will shake the earth terribly. We know that through the book of Isaiah. But it took them by surprise. Why did they not know that day was upon them? Why did they not know? By the way, when they see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven? Well, that's heralding the day of the Lord. It's too late for them. You see, after that, after they hide themselves in the rocks and caves, tribes of the earth mourn, and they're scared to death, it says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. At that point, you have nothing to worry about. You're in the full guidance at that point. Full guidance. Prior to that point, it's not going to be good. There's tribulation before that. Everybody's scared of the tribulation before that. Hear me out. The Lord says there was, uh, there was tribulation before that time. Did they notice that or was that tribulation subtle? Listen, we discussed this too. What's worse? The killing of your flesh or the destruction of your soul? What's a worse tribulation? What is a worse tribulation than the direct attack upon your soul? See, if you're killed, that doesn't do the Satan any justice. That's not winning. That's expediting. That's expediting your final place with the Lord. But if he attacks your soul, that's great tribulation. An attack upon the soul is his. That's what he wants. Who is in the, the greatest tribulation of these days? If the world did not know that the day of the Lord was coming, it, it, that tribulation was not directed towards them. Was it? it wasn't directed towards them. That this tribulation is not directed towards people of sin, but it's directed towards the believers in Jesus Christ. And if it's directed towards the believers in Jesus Christ, it's directed towards your soul. Hence, many will fall away. There'll be a great falling away first. Now, a great falling away can only happen if there are consistent attacks upon the soul, your belief system, your faith. They will dazzle you with the findings that they have. They will shock the entire world. Some of you may cry when they reveal what's been among us all this time. They will twist the story. No one will believe in the Old Testament, not many, but rather they'll believe in the scientist's view the scientists view if people only knew what they were facing but you know what it's very dangerous to discuss that you can talk about anything you want you can talk about uh, anything you want but there's one national security topic that you can go missing stupid lights in the sky because they're covering for something that's detrimental to preserving a lifestyle they've established your honor yes they do try and you know what, it's funny, I, I have to say this. All you guys have heard rumors. Well, they're going to disclose the secrets that they had, right? They're going to disclose them wrong. They're never going to disclose them. Prior to them becoming president, let me, let me tell you how it works. Take it or leave it. Let me tell you how it works. Prior to anyone becoming president, save a few, save a couple, they said, yes, we're going to disclose it. But as soon as they're shown the evidence and the proof and they're told the reasoning behind this, that, and the other, they say the public is better off never, ever knowing this. Because it will shake the foundations. 
of life itself. Indeed, in a while to shake the foundations of life itself, there would be no more freedom of religion. There would be no more freedom of religion. There would only be the truth left. And it just so happens that that truth supports the Christians. Oh, they don't want that. They don't want the truth supporting the Christians. Plus, they're told we are occupants here, not the controllers. We may do a great many things, but we have limitations. And if their presence is known, they have the ability to destroy a nation or Earth within seconds. And they've been shown demonstrations, personally. But see, they're scared of them. They are scared of the forces that are not permitted to touch you. They buy into the lie because of great fear. Great fear and trembling they have towards these things, but they're about to see something a trillion times more powerful. That's the Lord our God, because when he comes, all the lights, all the stars, and everything else will bow themselves to his presence. Time itself will cease to be at his rising. The earth will shudder. The mountains will melt. Everything changes when he rises. You see, they're scared of something he created, who, in fact, have a lot of abilities, a lot. But when God comes the creator of all things, it'll make the fallen angels look like ants. And when he comes, then men will know the fear of the Lord, not in word, but to the roots of their very souls. You see, at that point, they know exactly who's coming because he cannot rise and everybody not know who he is. Instinctively, they will know who he is. The angels will quake. The heavens will tremble. You see, God moving is not a light thing. All his creation submits upon his moving. All of creation submits upon his moving. All dimensions submit upon his moving. He is not a man. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the God of all things. He is the I Am of all things. He is everything, and through him all things exist. Through one word, everything can be destroyed. Through a thought, all of us could be undone. Are you kidding? He is more than we can comprehend. Yes, his creation, the things he created, men think are all powerful. They know that those ruling entities of old are coming back. These people know that. Some of them have already arrived, yet they still cannot touch you. Their influences are being felt in the earth. Don't blame it on just a bunch of people collectively got together and got angry and decided to, to initiate a plan. That's No, these, these entities carry an atmosphere around them. A feeling that rubs off on everybody who rubs off on who gets close to them. Everyone that arrives, this world becomes darker and darker until one day it's going to be a gross darkness upon the earth. Isn't that something? But you were made the lamp. You are the light of the earth. You are. Not them. Not those who follow them. You are. Darkness cannot overtake the light. Your light comes directly from the throne and the power of the Almighty God. Nothing can put that out. The only person that can put out your light is you. That's based upon your choices. It's based upon who you choose. Now remember, you can't choose him in word and say, I choose God and don't do anything Jesus said to do. You have to do what Jesus instructed you to do. Then you are in fact his child then Jesus is in fact your Lord. And if you keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, the Father loves you, and the Father and Jesus will come and commune with you. Jesus said that. That is an assurance for you. But if you call him Lord, and you don't keep his commandments, you don't listen to what he told us to do, you're following a different spirit. His spirit's not in you when you don't listen to him. Because you're working by another spirit. See, even that great falling away first, those people who fell away, those people who fell away, I am convinced of God in the first place. Yet, the tares grew up with the wheat, grew up with the wheat. They learned together. They praised together. But ultimately, who a person really is comes out in the end. 
and the tares are harvested first. That's what Jesus said in the book of Matthew when he was talking about the end of the world. The tares are harvested first. We don't know how they're harvested. They could just utterly be consumed and destroyed. But they're harvested first. The tares are. But still, they didn't know what hit them because they do not until the floodwaters came and took them all away. Listen, the Lord said watch because the signs are subtle and then kabang. It's too late at the kabang moment. We have an opportunity now to actually exercise our faith and believe him. Have you ever been disappointed in not believing the Lord? You didn't really believe him and then something happened and you instantly recognized, I should have trusted in him, but I didn't. And you felt sorrowful for it. Have you ever done that? If you have, listen to me. We have the opportunity now to trust him 100%, to exercise our trust in him, to be patient with him right now. You see, it says, without, if you don't have faith, it's impossible to please God. So the opposite is true, to please him. If you have faith in him, that pleases him. If you don't have faith in him, it's impossible for you to please him. He desires our faith in his word. But we must read more than the word. We must do these things in our deeds. We must. We must subdue our flesh. And most importantly, we must hold fast to those things that we have. Because listen, the rumor mills are winding up. Where do you think scoffers came from? You know where scoffers came from? Let me tell you what scoffing is. Scoffing is this. Uh Uh-huh, see, I told you I was right in the first place. Where's the promise? Say, where's the promise of his coming? And then the Lord says something in the book of Isaiah that'll just turn everybody upside down. Because those who waited on him, he's not going to disappoint them. He won't. Because they waited on him in faith, he won't disappoint them. You see, there are still mysteries that will be mysteries until the Lord establishes what he is going to establish at the end, 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 end of the years. We can't figure everything out, but what we must do is this. Believe what he said. We must believe what he said. The full understanding will come when it's all said and done. And in saying that, it's not important how we leave, when we leave, or anything else. Put it in your mind, in your heart, Lord, I'm going to go with you until the end of this race. Put that in your heart and mind. Don't be a clock watcher, but always take a note of the changes in the season. If you're in a rush to get out of here and you have something undone, you could want to get out of here till you're doomed. That's why you haven't gone anywhere yet, because when you're finished here, you will go. When your job is done here on earth, you're gone. You're out of here. Your mission is up. Your time is up. You've finished your race. If you have not finished your race, you're going to still live here. That means you're not ready. Every day we need to choose who we're going to serve. If the Lord gives me this day, but I want to get out of this day, I'm the one in error. I'm not taking full advantage of what he's granted me for this day. He wants me to do something. If I'm in a rush to get out of here, that means I I desire not to work. But if I say this in my heart, Lord, I'm going to go with you to the very end. I have decided in my heart to do what it takes for his sake until the very end. Why? Because I know he loves me. If it's one thing the Lord has proven to me over and over is that he loves me. I'm not in a rush to go anywhere. That's his call. But while he grants me every single day, I'm going to do what I can for him. You see, if we think along those lines, you'll find out something I did. We don't have enough time. If it was 100 years from now, we don't have enough time. If it were 500 years from now, we still don't have enough time. Look at the time we had in our lives and how long it took us to turn around. Now you're facing another generation who is twice as reprobate as we were. There's not enough time. If you really think about it, there's not enough time. I took it upon myself. I really reflect. Now I hunt people down. Sometimes I'll say an apology to people that I've never spoken to in a long time. You know why? It's in my heart. When the Lord brings something to my heart that I've ever done against anybody, I'll go hunt them down just to say, I'm sorry. It could have been 40 years ago. I'll say, I'm sorry. When the Lord places something like that on your heart, then you realize, thank you, Lord, for this time you gave me. 
How many people could we actually go back to in humility and say, you know what, forgive me for that? How many people do we still have in our lives that we have ill will towards because of something they did? See, if it's forgiven, you have no ill will toward anybody. If you understand that you're not a, a flesh being walking around here, but you're actually spirit, you don't care about what anybody does to your body. That would be like me getting mad at all those who I took fire from or got wounded from. That doesn't bother me. Everybody's given the same opportunity. I'm no better than they are, but I do owe them a debt of love. When you really understand that, you don't care if a person wronged you. I've had people wrong me all the time. They really do. They try to get by on you and everything else. Of course, the Lord opens your eyes to it. If you're able to handle it, if you can still stay humble and meek, and some good can be bought out of that situation, not based on your own eyes, but according to his goodness, you'll see a lot of things. Even if I was right and somebody else was dead wrong, it wouldn't matter. Because in my eyes, there's always something more I could have done to diffuse something, to show more love to that individual. Sometimes it's not important who's right and who's wrong. It's important that love, true love, is conveyed from one to another. If right and wrong were important, nobody would convey love to the person who's out there in the world. That's how they got there in the first place, by the way. A loss of love. People get grumpy when they have a loss of love. Something has gone wrong in people's lives when they're grumpy and angry and hateful. They have a loss of love. It's like a baby crying, throwing a tantrum. They've been abandoned. And when you think of things like that, because we're all children. Even Moses was still a child of God. Abraham was a child of God. No man is an equal to God. We're all children. But if you think of things along those routes, it, it takes the sting out of what Satan attempts to plant in our lives. It takes that when, when somebody's upset with you, it kind of nullifies that also. You'll find yourself as a peacemaker. A peacemaker. When you are a peacemaker, you do in fact have peace. You reap peace all the time. People come against you. True, they're always going to come against you no matter what you are. Unless you're serving Satan, people are going to come against you. Unless you're serving Satan, they're going to talk false things about you. They're going to believe things about them. They can't even justify their own beliefs. They'll say, oh, I just feel it. Something, I just feel it. They can't justify it. That's going to happen. That will happen. However, if you stay humble and in meekness, the Lord can then entrust you with the truth. You know, he says, if he can trust you with a little, I'm paraphrasing, he'll trust you with a lot. You know, the same thing goes with levels of good things. If he can trust you in the small things, with your gifting, you could bestow more upon you. But if you can't with the small thing, which he has done some people, some people have natural gifts and have absolutely abused them, and they go no further. Absolutely abused them. We have an opportunity, with a, a, a very real opportunity. You see, as the, as the noise of the world increases, our, our, the noise of the world raises, when the attacks begin and everything else, some people think they have to go huddle in the corner. Wrong. That's our moment of opportunity. Do you know the Lord is closest to you when the trouble comes? When the trouble comes, he's present. So have your act together because he's present. His words are strong upon his children during those times. So a lot of people are coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. At the same time, the world is becoming very evil. Why is that? You can have peace in a time, a tumultuous time. You just have to change your own perspective. It's not very hard to see things as our Lord and Savior saw things. You just have to read his words and do them. Just do them. If you want to be transformed, that takes place by the renewing of your mind. That renewing is in him, not in the world, in him. You see, the philosophies of the world are destructive to you. The ways of the world are destructive to you. Everything they teach, just about, is very destructive to you. And it takes discernment to know what to keep and what not to keep. But I will not keep the world's philosophy. I do not practice their ways. But I enjoy the Father's word. Even when it cuts me in 29 million pieces, I enjoy it. I end up saying thank you. You know why there's no pride there? None. 
There's no pride there. What is pride anyway? What what can that do for a person? What can pride do but make you defend something that's not worth defending? Being proud of one's own accomplishments, which means you're trying to maintain that you're a certain type of person in view of everybody else. Listen, you're accountable to the Father alone, not with everybody else. If we can do what the Lord Jesus told us to do, believe me, everybody else and pleasing them will soon take its proper position. You're going to find out that you had it wrong to begin with. But we are individually accountable for ourselves. No one can help you in that respect. You know what? That's all part of that what? Delusion. The Lord will send them over to a strong delusion that they would believe a lie that they all might be damned. Why? Because they did not accept his words. They called him Lord and did nothing he said to do. That's why those people got up in front of him and did all those miracles and everything else. And he said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. In them they worked iniquity, which is to not do what Jesus said to do. They worked iniquity. And we know that iniquity will abound It'll be everywhere. It's growing, multiplying itself. It's spreading. A great, great, great hatred is soon to take effect. Have you ever thought about the scenarios, the very real scenarios? These little ploys that they try to put on the media to spark the dislike of races in your view. A black kid being shot by a white cop. A white guy beat up by some black people. Mexicans coming across the border. They're making people hate the races. Can't you see that a race war, a race war, with all races combined, is at the heart and soul of a great many people's anger. You can talk about a ton of subjects. And when a person gets angry, normally it goes back to race. And believe me, they trend Facebook. They know that the younger generation could care less about race. But those who are the working middle class right now, they do care about it. They're going to utilize it to sow discord. Because as I told you before, they need you as a participant in their witchcraft. You don't think they're doing witchcraft? They are performing witchcraft every day. Every day. They are promoting and performing witchcraft every single day. And if you so much as join in their violence and hate, it enters your heart. What do you think Obama's there for? What do you think? What do you think he's there for? To provoke you into hatred. It provokes a certain type of person into hatred. And then when you begin to hate, your doors open up and say, Come on in, demons. I'm ripe for you to just jump in me and start to use me. Doesn't matter how long they're there for. But when vile thoughts into your head, you think those are your thoughts. They're influenced. The Bible says a man can do nothing of himself. That means... Whether he steps good or bad, he's being influenced by something. Who are you influenced by? The Lord? Demonic entities. Witchcraft is rising. It's working. Violence is its result. Violence is the result of witchcraft. Who do you see on the earth right now? Violence. Did you notice that when everybody in America a long time ago in the 80s were in church, church was a big thing. Everything started calming down. Even Russia calmed down. They collaborated against the funny lights in the sky. By the way, if the funny lights don't exist, then why was there collaboration between the two presidents, our president here, and Russia, to tell each other when these things appear so that nobody would start a nuclear war because of them? See, when they come around, they, they tend to turn on nuclear weapons and place coordinates in the targeting computers, and everybody goes frantic. Then they cut communication lines where one country can't get in contact with the other. It's almost like they want to preempt war. Those were demonstrations to say that they can preempt anything they want to. Listen, the principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, that is real. That's those lights in the sky, you see. Save you, except for you and for your sakes. They cannot touch you, but they have dominion over just about everything else. They take what they want. As the world's iniquity grows and grows and grows, more of them will keep arriving. They just keep popping in. This world's going to be awful. They just keep coming. I'm telling you something that's real. This isn't fantasy. This is real. And you know who they like to work through? 
if you have so much as an ounce of pride in you, no demon in hell will listen to anything you have to say. Because it's against the law. Listen, God said he resists the proud. If he's resisting you through his authority, you can't do it. You just nullified your own authority. And if you, these people who walk in pride, they're going to be torn to pieces, overtaken, scared to death. See, they use people to do their little dirty work. They can't touch you directly, but they can make laws against you. Have you ever noticed that no one can really touch you directly unless you invite them into your life? But they can make laws against you. They can pass sort of uh, sanction type things against you. Policy can be against you. The world can be formulated against you, but they can't touch you. They can't touch you unless you invite them in, which means if you join in on a violent act, you can then be treated violently. If you attack a person, you can then be attacked. If you verbally abuse a person, you can then be verbally abused. Oh, you don't think Satan knows all the governing laws of the Father? Yes, he does. And he waits for you to make a mistake and not repent. So he can say, oops, well, now I have permission to go do to this person what they just did. And the Lord says, well, my word is true. Whatsoever a man sold, that shall he reap also. Go do what you have to do. Satan is on his job waiting for you to slip up. Yes, a great many of us still toy with our Christianity. You shouldn't toy with it. You really shouldn't toy with it. Not at all. Toy with it. People get upset and everything else because something didn't work out. If something failed and something didn't go right. Well, if they had their hope in the kingdom, nothing could touch their joy. Satan can only take your joy when it's in one of his kingdoms. Satan cannot take your joy if your joy rests in the eternal kingdom. You can't touch it. You see, when it's just like if a child dies, and you know where that child went, Satan cannot take that joy. He can't spin that story or anything else. Then the Spirit hits you and gives you some truth. Like this saying, how can you miss something that will always appear? How can you miss someone that was not taken away? Yet they are in fuel, pure joy. When you understand that, and you understand that he can't take anything away from you here, he can't get to you. Some of us, because he can't get to you, he works through the closest thing to you. And then you have to stay prayed up. You have to stay prayed up. But if you understand and believe the words of your Lord and Savior, how in the world can you really get upset? We normally get upset when things fail us. When we understand that God is in full control, he has not lost control. He has not lost control. Nothing can exist without his approval. His eyes are upon all things. Every atom that moves, he's aware of it. Every particle that floats, he's aware of it. That's a powerful thing to conceive. Every formation of every object has to be sanctioned by him. If that were not the case, physics would not work. You see, there are laws for everything, how the air moves, how gravity works. Those are his laws. He's intimately aware of everything, everything. If you sneeze, he knows what came out of your body. He made a perfect world to recycle everything. You don't know the intimate details of this world and how it can regulate itself, how it offsets itself to compensate for mankind, how it changes and adapts to compensate our lifestyles. Nature does this. He created the world and the animals first. He built the house first, and then he put his children in the house to have dominion over it. He built it for his children. He built this world for his children. He didn't build the children for the world. He built the world for the children. How long, ladies and gentlemen, will we continue to let Satan beguile us in so many things to take away our joy that we are supposed to have, to take away the peace that surpasses all understanding? How many times will we engage him and not resist him? How often? Do we have to go through the process of being abased when we are prideful? Now, the other phase comes into this world. The phase that no one could go, no one before you could go through this or they would exist today. The world will not notice it. You will notice. The Father stands for his children. Yet he desires no one to perish outside of him. He takes no pleasure in anyone perishing outside of him. But everything that's happening is happening for your deliverance. 
Have you ever thought about that? Everything that happens is happening through your deliverance. Where then is sorrow? If he does everything for your deliverance, then sorrow is a product of not understanding exactly what he's doing. Sorrow is a result of not acknowledging that he's in full control. He knows what he's doing. His thoughts are higher, much higher, well out of the realm of even our wildest imaginations and computations. We cannot conceive of what he really is. We can't. To know him intimately would mean that you would have to be in another form. Your brain could not hold that information. The universe can't hold his existence. He will keep you in perfect peace. If your mind has stayed on him, if your mind is on him, he can and will keep you in perfect peace. We lose our peace when our thoughts go outside of him. You won't lose your peace. If your mind is on him. If you're about to make a phone call and he's at the forefront of your mind, you're going to have your peace. During the middle of a conversation, when you're mindful of him, you're going to have your peace. When things go wrong according to your vision of what you see, you'll understand that he's in absolute control. You're still going to have your peace. You will no longer trust what you see with your eyes because you'll know that everything you see is subject to change. But he is consistent. You won't lose your peace. We have to renew our minds. That's the full transformation. To renew our minds, in the words of Jesus Christ, that's the full transformation. Notice it didn't say partially renew your mind. We have to renew our minds. To renew something, you have to get rid of the old stuff and put in the new. You don't put old wine in new wine skins. We have to renew our minds. And the scripture says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the words Jesus spoke is your true identity. Your true identity is in the words Jesus spoke. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't listen to the identity the world gave you. It sought to kill you, to destroy you, but it couldn't. You can't put the, James, you can't put the uh, uh, old in the new either. You can't mix the two together. But the Lord gave us an identity. Don't accept the world's identity for you. It has attempted to label you from your birth. That's why people go through things when they're children. Satan tries to grab a hold on a great many people, telling them, don't forget that situation, that was unfair, this, that, and the other. Then the media drives that garbage until you become old and you're, you have a bitterness in your soul. Get rid of that. Get rid of it. You are not your flesh. You're an eternal being. One day your flesh will be removed from you. It's going to die. It's going to be changed or die. You are eternal. There is no ending for you. You will continue. There's no ending for you. You are not your flesh. You're not defined by your flesh or anything else. If you got a billion plus a trillion tattoos, you're still not defined by your flesh. You know what? Some people, they, they'll look at a person. Just to speak about tattoos, they'll look at a person and say, oh, they surely, they can't be, but their tattoos are like us. See, all they can see is externally. They can't see internally. But you know what? True discernment with true discernment, if the Lord permits, you can see the goodness in another person. You can feel that you'll automatically identify with the goodness in another person. The world does not do that. They condemn anything good. Anything good they condemn. And anybody operating in the world will condemn you. But first they try to get close to you. Here's how say mercy flatters you some type of way to get close to you. Once he gets close to you, he makes suggestions after suggestions. If you don't fall through with that, then he does it by force because he's taking you, he's got you off balance. Then he does what he does and makes you feel like it was your fault. This is the way he works. He works like this all the time. He'll do something to you and then make you feel like it's your fault. But you see, that's called venom. That's called venom. Whether by word or by actual venom. That's right. Spiritual pain. And when, according to Daniel, God's kingdom is set on earth, the everlasting kingdom that will not be removed, the kingdom that will settle itself down, his house set here, his house, set here, including the New Jerusalem, well, then people will know, won't they? 
Yes, his kingdom is at hand. Which, by the way, the kingdom of God is the gospel. That word kingdom meant the dominion of God is in the gospel. You guys got that? Kingdom, dominion, that dominion of God is in the gospels of Jesus Christ. It's in the gospels of Jesus Christ. That's why he said kingdom. And then he said, when he sets up his total kingdom in Hebraic, that would mean his total tabernacle is set up here on earth. It is inclusive, but even that's beyond imagination. Let's finish our race. We have a lot to look forward to. And nobody should ever just, oh, well, i got to get through this race first. No, don't think of it like that. That's the world's way of thinking about tasks. This is a lifestyle. This is something you can take joy in every step of the way. This is something that is part of you, part of your heritage, and part of your future. This is everlasting. You can't labor for the Lord and it be counted as nothing. This is everlasting. This won't go away. The rest of the stuff is going up in smoke. This is everlasting. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.